let me just get this out of the way right now. Godzilla X Kong is gonna get just all of the crap, especially after the incredibly moving Godzilla Minus One just dropped, and I do not care, man. The human characters in this movie exist purely to make you laugh or pay their exposition tax to fuel the monster brawl. The plot is so hilariously convenient, I truly believe it was intentionally done like this. And the theme of found family is so on the nose, I'm fairly certain that's what this face paint translates to. And with all that being said, this is the best Showa Godzilla movie ever made. And no, obviously, that does not include the original, even though it started everything. I believe that movie's vision is so powerful and different, it deserves to be standalone, as opposed to lumped in with the rest of the franchise. There's just so much to get into that for convenience sake, I've decided to turn this video into a nifty little top 5 list to help me explain just why I feel this is the perfect send up to the campy Showa classics that defined what Godzilla is to so many generations of people. So let's bow in and go over why Godzilla X Kong is the best Showa movie ever made. <laughs> The best way I can describe the tone of this movie is that if Godzilla vs. Kong dipped its toes into the show of silliness, this movie just swan dived right into the deep end. As I mentioned at the beginning of the vid, I feel like original flavor Godzilla deserves to stand on its own because out of the whopping 15 entries in the Showa era, it is the only one that kept its tongue firmly out of its cheek and in my mouth. <laughs> Beyond the initial apprehension of there being a man in a charcoal dragon suit, the rest of that movie is played straighter than my dad at church. Yet the other 14 movies range from being cool with beer goggles on to lacking so much self-awareness you'd think they were written by a YouTuber. Pour one out for Bono, this one's for you, you f***ing madman. With the pregame out of the way, this is your spoiler warning. I'm going all in on this video, so I totally understand if you don't want any of the genuinely hilarious or fun moments to be ruined in advance. To everybody left, did anyone else feel like the movie was smiling at you the whole time? Everything just feels so alive and vibrant with a sense of forward momentum in every scene for better or worse, and puts me right back in the seat of watching something like Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. So the plot of this movie follows Kong suffering from isolation anxiety that has slowly built up over the years, while Godzilla is completely done giving a f when it comes to dealing with other titans. This is actually a plot relevant character point now, and I'll go more into it in the next section. But conveniently enough, the inner workings of Hollow Earth have shifted to the point that the Scar King's forces are able to escape their prison. Or at least that's what I could gather from it. This prompts the Iwi tribe that has been hidden deep within Hollow Earth to reach out to Godzilla and get him to help them. So he sets off to grind some nuclear XP and prep for the upcoming battle. Although now that I'm saying it out loud, the Scar King forces may have been freed because of the Iwi messages? I got no idea, man, and the movie doesn't either. There's a line from Bernie that power fluctuations just happen alongside major world events like Ghidorah. It's not like they tried super hard on this plot point. From here, Gia starts getting the same messages as Goji, Kong gets a tooth removed so we can introduce Trapper, the Ginger Plague attacks a monarch outpost, while Godzilla heads to France. So Team Monkey decides to escort the Big K back to Hollow Earth and check out what happened to the outpost. And from here, the movie splits off into three parts. The human element sees our squad trek through the Hollow Earth while eventually figuring out what's really going on with the underground civilization and essentially just giving us cute little character gags and exposition. Kong's story has him finding Ginger Kong. Oh, sick! Gross! And the two of them go on a little adventure back to the Scar King's domain. And that new God of War game looks crazy. While the King of the Monsters rounds out the Trinity by finding out a way to go Super Saiyan. <laughs> the stories converge when Kong gets his ass kicked by Scar King and Shimo, who I'll cover later, and heads back to the humans with the Iwi tribe by telepathically sensing where Gia is. 
Okay. After hooking him up with the Power Glove, Kong heads back to the surface to grab Godzilla, and after a brief scuffle, Mothra is brought back to life and stops the fight. And I got a lot to say about that scene, but this sets up the end game where they head back down, fight for a little bit, then head right back up and finish the battle. Then the movie literally just ends with almost zero human interaction or dialogue. After relaying the entire plot, I feel like this movie and the original Pacific Rim are fantastic send-offs to what most people think of when they hear kaiju film. Are some parts completely contrived? Yes. Kong ending up with a damaged right hand that just so happened to have a mechanical glove designed to make him stronger and heal frostbite is really f silly. It's a bit rough and ready, but it should hold. It's good. It looks good, Trapper. Damn good. But there is also a fair amount of but, because, and therefore writing too. We've found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. but because of Mechagodzilla, the Beast Glove was designed. Because Godzilla is receiving an SOS, he is absorbing power. And because Tiamat didn't get out of the way, she had to be Kamehameha. <laughs> it's the blending of both and then writing and but because therefore writing that captures the feel of a Showa era movie. The plot makes sense, it's also just kind of dumb too, and that's okay. Aggression is his love language. Even if they were worked half to death, I get the feeling that everyone involved in the visual effects were having a pretty good go at it. Don't let people fool you, there's a fair amount of ground level perspectives of the destruction, as well as action figure fighting, and due to the environments they find themselves in, there's also moments where even the titans seem small. I've noticed quite a few people on Reddit criticizing that little bit of information, as well as calling the titans weightless, but I don't completely agree with that. Sure, there are definitely moments when the movie makes the titans feel small, but that helps sell that this is a world that can actually sustain life that grows to that size. Regardless, if you look at the water effects throughout the whole movie, they're still animated with the weight that comes from that large mass moving it. And at least for me, that's what kept the scale in place. As far as the weightless complaint goes, there are parts where the gravity is literally altered. <laughs> I warned you, it was a show of flick. But my point is that the other moments where that may have been a factor are either talking about Godzilla's strength or the Scar King's acrobatics. But I never felt like the suspension was pushed to the point of weightlessness. And I'm sorry, but I gotta give it to the action in this flick. It is a riot. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! I think the only set piece I didn't enjoy was the transition into Hollow Earth. And I'm not epileptic, but that sequence even gave me a headache, so heads up to whoever that might affect. The opening fight in this movie sees Kong luring a bunch of boar-like monsters into traps he set up in his hunting ground. And then when a few of them survive, he just rips one clean in half to scare them off. It's not only disgusting to us, but Kong himself, and establishes not only how much stronger he's grown, but also how much smarter he is now. We immediately cut from that moment to him showering off, and it's hilarious and firmly roots the tone for the rest of the film. To follow up on that, we see Scylla terrorizing Rome and Godzilla cleans her up in less than a minute. Why did she explode? Because it's cool. It's so over the top and hilarious, and just like Kong's opening battle, it's full of these little Godzilla character moments, like when he aggressively grabs, readjusts, and pins Scylla's legs down, just to make sure her ass can't get away. Also, safe to say that at this point, the monster vs. atomic breath charging noise is probably my favorite sound effect ever, even more so than the roars themselves. And that just gets to the choreography of the fights themselves. There is so much thought put into how these monsters battle that they have more noticeable identity in the way they move than the entire history of previous movies combined. Kong is not only adept at hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but he is constantly observing his opponent, aiming to block or intercept dangerous points of contact, and using his environment and awareness to his advantage. And the one time he was taken off guard was because he actively lowered it for the sake of reaching out to this little ginger bastard. <laughs> and yeah, I'm gonna mention it. 
This kid has a hell of a chin, because Kong literally uses him like a flail. Godzilla himself has shown to become more battle smart, but more importantly, has seemingly learned to gauge when he needs to escalate conflict. He gives Tiamat two warnings before completely dicing her, and his battle with Kong itself was a series of escalation before he had to be calmed down by Mothra. The highlight of the thought process put into these battles is in the anti-gravity sequence. Godzilla hits a butterfly twist and is beautifully graceful during that fight because he lives underwater and is used to that kind of environment. And if you'll notice, he also actively avoids killing force on Shimo, because he's aware that she's being controlled. If you pay attention, he only kills when he is forced to, or if he genuinely believes his target needs to be stopped. Which is why he doesn't just obliterate Scar King's army. If people loved him going full Komodo in the first movie, you get all that and more in this one. In my opinion, I think the best fights in the entire franchise are in King of the Monsters, but this may be tied with it. And ultimately, the reason why is because all of the action is character-informed and driven. Which brings me to my next point. When it comes to characters, we're gonna start with the two headliners. As I alluded to earlier, Kong has been dealing with severe loneliness, and it not only shows how desperate he is to find more of his own kind, but also to be around his human friends. He pulls himself out of the Hollow Earth to get his tooth taken care of, yes, but he also does it so he doesn't feel lonely, as evidenced by a few insert shots of his beautiful facial expressions. Once he does find others, not only does he try to save them despite their attempt at murdering his ass, but he also goes out of his way to humor the attempts on his life that this little soulless bastard tries to pull. Maybe it's because they're kaiju, or maybe it's because I'm biased, but despite the corniness, I genuinely I genuinely cared about Big K's journey, and I cared about the eventual turn that Son of Kong makes. But I think the best example of Kong's growth is in how he deals with Godzilla. Ugh. He knows exactly how to get his attention. You're a bitch! But immediately tries to de-escalate the situation when Goji shows up. And there are shots of him throughout the movie where he is visibly concerned with the well-being of the humans around him. A lot of people say this is another Kong movie, and they're right. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Especially considering that even though he isn't in the spotlight, Godzilla is dealing with his own art. The King of the Monsters wears the literal weight of the world on his shoulders in this movie, and just seems like a bitter, hardened vet. The closest comparison I could make is that this Godzilla is rapidly approaching the Logan version of the character. He gives everything in his path a warning, and if they don't move... And then you come to find out that this attitude is informed by Goji responding to a distress call from an indigenous people. And that casts him in such a misunderstood light. He's literally only trying to help, but you can feel the irritation with humanity in the way he disregards avoiding wanton destruction, compared to when he first showed up in 2014. And if you pay close attention and keep in mind the history of what this particular monster has gone through, he too carries a theme of loneliness. I walk a lonely road. Not only are monsters that have previously submitted to him in the past actively standing in his way instead of helping, but so are the people he's protecting. And to top it off, then Kong shows back up seemingly to challenge him. I'm with Goji. I'd be tired of people f***ing around too. The best examples of Godzilla not being just a mindless angry monster is when Mothra returns. For the first time in two movies, he softens up, and I'm not even kidding. Godzilla literally relaxes after Mothra shows up, and they have such a sweet reunion, with the whole eye contact and flowering music and everything. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Goji looks like he just found a lost loved one again, and in my opinion, that was the most heartwarming part of the movie, and probably my favorite scene. It's what cemented that I feel these versions of the characters are not only actual characters, 
but are by far the best iterations of the monsters we've ever had since the Heisei era. Speaking of Mothra too, she is also at the top of her game. Yeah, it's hella silly that not only is there a prophecy of her being revived by an Iwi from Skull Island specifically, not to mention she just appears in a flash of light, no egg or anything, but her actual character is perfectly preserved. She immediately calms down her boy and bridges the gap between him and Kong, as well as actively participating in the fight. She chooses to use her thread to tie up and not actively kill any of the attacking apes. She even ends up saving the humans. I really hope that in the future movies she keeps showing up, especially since it's rumored to be a Godzilla-centric adventure next time, because I love the bond between her and the king. And she didn't die! More please! <laughs> Speaking of more, unfortunately she doesn't get a lot of screen time owing to the fact that she doesn't show up until the last 30 minutes of the movie or so. However, now we've got to talk about the human element and believe it or not, I actually think they work. I saw so many people complaining about Bernie, but not only do I think he is infinitely better here than he was in Godzilla vs. Kong, but I think you need his dynamic in the group. <laughs> His chemistry with Trapper sells what would otherwise be tired, weak moments, and if you didn't have somebody a bit more lighthearted to play Trapper off of, this widely enjoyed character wouldn't have worked as well. And even if I think Bernie is overhated, I gotta agree with the fans on this one. Trapper needs to stick around for the next few movies. Obviously, since they lean more on the side of comic value, they don't contribute as much to the overall drama of the movie as opposed to just getting the plot going or espousing out themes. That gets us to the other two leads, and I'm at a bit of a conundrum with them. Gia and Andrews are supposed to be the heart of the movie. That's where the interpersonal drama comes from with the human element, right? The problem with it is even though I think the talent did fine in these roles, they didn't have much to do outside of fulfilling their plot purpose. And what's more, I don't know what more they could do after this movie. I think that even though I enjoyed their relationship well enough, I think they threw away a good arc by having Gia come back home. Andrews is honestly at her best as a character when she's a doctor dealing with a vlogger obsessed with conspiracy, a hippie, and a kiwi boss. Not a mom. Overall, the biggest problem with the humans is none of the characters really carry the same weight that Brian Cranston did way back in 2014. But that's when I gotta make a statement on preferences here. Personally, I have to highlight that, when I go to see a kaiju movie, I want the monsters to make me feel. And all I want from the humans is for them to entertain me. That's why even though I love Godzilla Minus One, and I think it is the single best movie that Godzilla has ever been in, I don't think it's the epitome of what a Godzilla movie is, nor is it anywhere near the top of my favorite list. But like I said, I'm well aware that's a me thing. Yet, we have to go from one weak point to another, and that takes us to the antagonist this time, Shimo and Scar King. I'ma just say it, Shimo should have been Anguirus or Gamera. Preferably, you would have changed her to not act like a puppy, but this design could have been repurposed as either of those two classics, and it would have given more room to forgive the lack of death. King Louis, on the other hand, I think is not only a great villain, but he is specifically a great villain because of how little of a threat he is. It has been a widely criticized point of this movie that there is a 0% chance of the Scar King succeeding. Godzilla is a literal Super Saiyan by the end of the movie, and I believe the fight only lasted as long as it did because his f***ing girlfriend came back less than five minutes before the battle. Yet there is something so charming in this little punk-ass monkey believing he had a snowball's chance in hell of taking down a Godzilla that literally burns the ocean by swimming through it. It's honestly just adorable, and it reminds me of Ebira of all things. This Godzilla has fought on screen, a little dragon, two members of a species designed to kill him, Kong, a gigantic crustacean, not Manda, alien Satan, and a robotic version of him piloted by alien Satan that has downloaded the entire move list of Conor McGregor. And then he powered up. Gingivitis here is obviously meant to be more of a metaphorical challenge to Kong and way less of an actual issue for Godzilla. Even though he's objectively a weak villain, I feel like that's by design. But the best thing about this is that the entire events of the movie establish the world as being so much bigger than we initially thought. Cue the segue. <laughs> Dude, 
The Showa era was f wild. We went from 50s era tech to balloon transportation two films later, and then aliens, mind control, and space travel shortly after that. And it only got better from there. The MonsterVerse seems to have taken a good look backwards before throwing silly sh** like realism completely in the trash, and diving headfirst into making a distinctly advanced age for our new future. But my favorite part is that not only does it balance advancements in technology and science, but it also maintains a genuine reverence for mythological and cultural rituals, which was also common in the Showa era. The best example I can think of before this movie is Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. In the same movie that humanity gets invaded by gorilla aliens, we have a shrine dedicated to resurrecting an ancient Shisa-inspired kaiju to aid our one true king in repelling the alien forces. Oh, and there's a mecha that's wearing a Godzilla suit too. Do you see the connections I'm trying to make here? Because GXK not only introduces a handful of new Hollow Earth wildlife, but also a bunch of cultural and futuristic technology. We even have Titan insurance and Titan vets. Truly, we are looking at a utopian society. My favorite part about all of this is that not only does the MonsterVerse feel like a series that keeps growing with each release, it has somehow managed to keep the focus entirely on the monsters themselves, and it has magically opened the door to any number of potential monster appearances. I get asked a lot, what monster would you want to see next? And this is always my answer. All of them? This world and these interpretations of classic kaiju is so compelling to me that I would love to see Gigan, Hedora, Biollante, King Caesar, there's another king for you, Batra, Anguirus, Destroya, and even Space Godzilla, who is heavily teased in this movie. I'm not even a fan of that monster. I think it's f***ing dumb, but I want to see him so badly in one of these movies. And that has to say something, right? Yeah, I'll admit, if you're not a fan of these movies, you have plenty of fair ground to stand on, and I am definitely part of the problem. Because these are everything I'm looking for in the kaiju flick. Godzilla, to me, isn't defined by the nightmarish hellscape that nuclear warfare creates. He's defined by being a powerful, roaring, neutral good kicker of asses. And that brings me to my final point. <laughs> The best example I have to show that Godzilla x Kong is actually a modern show of flick in disguise has to deal with the intentionally weaker aspects of the movie. Subtlety has never really been Godzilla's strong suit. I realize a bunch of people probably went to the comments to cite the various metaphors and allegories littered throughout Shin Godzilla, but that is very much the exception and not the rule. Even the original Godzilla had its symbolism literally burned into our favorite kaiju skin, so a lack of subtlety is not indicative of a lack of quality. However, while I would argue there's definitely a lack of quality in some aspects of the film, side note, please get rid of Junkie XL and bring back Bear McCreary for the soundtrack, a convenient Convenient or contrived plot is almost a hallmark of the genre, and not necessarily a sign of poor quality. This movie's got jokes. Jokes that land. The actors do a fine enough job. The visual effects look great. It's all just... convenient. It's an easy watch, just like the classic Godzilla movies before it. You can say it's turn your brain off entertainment, but as I mentioned in the character and action sections, there's a ton of thought that went into the choreography and monster motivations that not only get informed and stay consistent throughout the events in the movie, but are also informed by events in the previous films. You don't just get that depth without putting work into it. They simply prioritize different aspects of the entirety that is the movie-making process. Could they have set up in advance that the Beast Glove was in the Hollow Earth before the exact moment they needed it? Sure. But that doesn't destroy the movie, it just plants its tongue firmly in the cheek. Also, the scene where Kong puts on the glove has a direct homage to the cover of Primal Rage and, uh... Yeah, I'm gonna have to ask Netherrealm to hurry the f*** up and remake that game with Goji and Kong as guest characters. Where was I?
Oh, yeah, I feel that it was a deliberate choice to have parts of the script be contrived, so that it further maintained the pace and tone of a classic Showa-era kaiju film. But that doesn't mean it was perfect, or it was perfect because it was intentionally bad in spots. Nah, there are some parts of the movie that actively suck. For one thing, and this was pointed out by everybody I saw the movie with, there is almost no respect for human life in the movie. This is the only one that treats human casualties like they're absolutely nothing, and that felt a little gross, frankly. And as I mentioned before, the soundtrack in this one is easily the weakest out of the franchise. There's plenty that could have been done to make this movie go above and beyond, but at least it doesn't feel like the MonsterVerse has completely run out of steam unlike every other cinematic universe out there right now. Speaking of that, did you know we're getting a slasher horror themed Winnie the Pooh-niverse? Featuring an entire roster composed of former Disney IPs. Can't f wait to cover that dumpster fire on here. And that reminds me, I've already got one more Godzilla video coming out next week, but after that, I'm kind of torn on whether I want to go ahead and get started on the Blood and Honey movies, or if I want to do an Alien retrospective to get ready for Romulus. So go ahead and let me know which one you think I should cover next, and please, please, please let me know what you think of the MonsterVerse in the comments below. I love these movies so much that I could talk about them all day with you. As always, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and sub. It always helps the channel, and I truly appreciate both your time and energy spent watching this video. But until next time, I'm bowing out. And I'll see you all when the king returns.